Welcome back to Justice and Peace. For this episode, we're looking at two main things. First, the state and federal response to protesters, and second, the demands of the protest. First, as to the response, we're hearing reports that not only the federal government allowing the DEA to, the department uh, that's supposed to be looking to prosecute people for drugs, but they're allowing them broad spectrum to surveil people for any types of crimes. Not only that, they can collect that information and distribute it to other, both state, local, and federal governments. So where is this information going when we're simply protesting, when we're simply exercising our First Amendment right? Use one right, and they'll violate the other, that being the Fourth Amendment. Let's take a look at some of these peaceful protests that they want to surveil. You can't stop the revolution! Breonna Taylor was murdered inside of her home. We've been incredibly patient. You think that we're angry and this is just coming out of nowhere, but it's not. No justice! No At some point, there's going to be some loss of faith, and that's what's starting to happen. Protest! Protest! And they were grabbing things and they were putting it inside of their cars, and police had to actually direct out traffic. Uh, they were directing traffic, well, knowing perfectly well that these cars were filled with, uh, with loot. All right, so I'm joined by Sue Ann Robinson, uh, criminal defense attorney as well as civil rights attorney. Sue Ann, thank you very much for being with us. In those clips, we're seeing both uh, peaceful protests as well as some looting, but it seems like the DEA and local governments are going to start treating people all the same. If you're there protesting, they're going to collect your information. How does that work? Is that not uh, a huge violation of our constitutional rights? Well, the issue is that there are rioters, there are protesters, and then there are looters. And I think for the purposes of people who are against rioting, looting, and protesting as a constitutional right, they're trying to suppress that under the guise of security, essentially. And I think that the protesters and to a certain extent the rioters are basically the first responders of our Constitution at this time. And so you know, anything that's going to infringe or prohibit them from exercising their rights, I don't think is appropriate. I would agree. And so not only are we getting this collection of data that we, we have no idea when we're going to get collected, where that information is going to go, how they're going to use that information, for how long they're going to keep that information, it seems that some cities also implemented curfews. Now, those curfews have been lifted in certain, uh, certain cities, sorry, like New York City and Chicago, but some are still existing. It's not necessarily the curfews that I'm having a major issue with. It's the implementation of those curfews and what happens to people who break those curfews, who are peacefully protesting and the violence exerted against them. Let's take a look at some of that. Hard images to watch, but these hard images are what's going to push us towards justice and peace in this country. Because until everyone is galvanized, until everyone is angry about how they're treating the sum or just the minority group of people, nothing's going to change. Uh, Sue Ann, what are you seeing from some of these reactions to the police as they're shooting rubber bullets? They're arresting people for exercising their rights. How do we move uh, from the place we're in now to a place of justice and peace? 
This was my concern when um, 45 started announcing that he wanted to send in the National Guard and national troops. It's bad enough that you already have police that are not trained and not able to um, effectively police a peaceful protest, but adding into it active military to a peaceful protest who are not trained to do that. That's not what their job is. And so it creates an environment where the objective of the protesters is to be heard, is to be seen, and to move toward change. And the police officers are just thrown in there, given these orders to suppress these rights. And it, it's not appropriate. They, they have to be properly trained on what the actual protesters' rights are. And you know that's why there's legal observers, but obviously legal observers can't be everywhere. But I think the most important thing is for the chief of police in these cities where protests are still taking place to take the time to actually discuss with the officers what the protesters are allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. The problems with curfew is like a lot of things in this situation. It's subjectively enforced. And so if you have implicit bias, the police have implicit bias, then they're going to certain areas or they're um, arresting certain types of protesters. And that's the whole issue. The whole issue is that implicit bias is causing subjectivity and disparate um, treatment and impact of the laws. And that's why the people are protesting in the first place. I think the more police officers respond to protesters in a harsh, not understanding way, the more that it's going to go on because it's almost fueling the reason for the protest in the first place. So I, I like the angle you're coming at because it's going to really help us go into our next segment after the break, where we talk about the response from the protesters. There is an argument that, hey, reform needs to happen, more training, no more officers, more teaching. Uh, but other people are saying defund the police and take those roles out of the police's hands and give them to other people um, who are funded properly to address those issues. We're going to talk about more of that after the break. Welcome back. Shifting gears just a little for a moment, we're going to talk about the two officers who were arrested in Buffalo, New York, for shoving 75-year-old Martin Gugino down to the floor. Now, this video went viral, and many people not only uh, spoke about the action of being callous, but also the response afterwards when officers just simply walked over his body. Now, after that, they were charged with what's called assault in the second degree. The specific subsection is what someone referred to as like elder abuse. And the reason why it's such a high felony is because of the difference of age between the alleged criminal and the victim. The victim being 75 years old and the officers being um, under the age of 65 by more than 10 years, that's why you get that high discrepancy in the charge and that's why it's so serious. That charge is made there to protect our senior citizens, but now you have officers breaking it in the middle of broad daylight. Let's take a look at more of this information and not only that, the reaction to the officers after they got arrested. Two police officers were charged with felony assault during a protest in Buffalo, and they were applauded by their colleagues as they left the courthouse. Officers Robert McCabe and Aaron Torgalski pleaded not guilty. They were released without bail. So when people tell me that we need more money for police, better training, more this, more that, when it comes to these videos, George Floyd and now Mr. Uh, uh, Gugino, I'm asking myself, what's going to change if we give more money? You have four officers participating and watching killing George Floyd. You have, I can't count how many officers there in Buffalo, stepping over the body of Mr. Uh, Gugino, and onlookers telling them, you're killing him. I know that technique you're using. 
I know that that maneuver you're putting on George Floyd's neck. You have people saying, call him an ambulance, do this. We as citizens have common sense and could have stopped what occurred, but officers need some sort of specialized training to prevent what we see is already wrong. Sue Ann, where am I getting this disconnect? Where, like, wh what are you seeing from this? How are we supposed to solve this? Yeah, the, the issue is, and I'm not, and I don't think that the officers need more money to be able to be trained in, in terms of their humanity. That's, that's a basic thing. The issue in that case, the video that you showed, is that officers are first responders. They have a duty to render aid. So when once they're also doing what they're trained initially in terms of pushing a protester out of the way because the protester is breaking their line. So that's what they're trained to do. They need to keep their line. The issue is once he falls to the ground and he's bleeding, they have a duty to render aid. And there's almost like a herd mentality in that there's an officer that's willing to render aid and another officer is like, no, 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 don't do that. And then the other officers that are kind of thinking like, wait, no, but this is a older male, we should be assisting, is just they're all walking by because now they're concerned of how they're gonna be treated if they kind of break the line or break rank or do something that can be perceived as not sticking with you know, the guidelines of what the group is doing. And I think that's the issue. The issue is there has to be a way for the good officers to stand up and to do what's appropriate when someone else, when another officer is doing something wrong. And I think that has to be encouraged in the culture. That's not a training issue. That's not something that goes to money. That's a culture issue within a police department. And in order for you to change the culture of a police department, there has to be some sort of radical change. There has to be some radical level of accountability in order for other officers to see, hey, listen, if we don't stand by and let these bad apples destroy us, if we stand up and do the right thing, then we're gonna be rewarded. As opposed to if we stick to the plan or we hold the line or we treat people poorly or we allow other officers to treat people poorly, then we're gonna be somehow protected or we're gonna be rewarded in that instance. I have a case right now out of Broward County in Fort Lauderdale where Sunrise Police Department um, you know, chased the suspect. He got into a body of water and one officer was attempting to take off their clothes to save the person, and he ended up drowning because the officers didn't render aid. And they're first responders. So there is a culture of, um, you know, not sticking to that first part of their oath, which is to serve, which is to render aid. And that's really part of the culture that has to be dismantled. And, and I like the words that you're using there, dismantling somewhat of a radical change. And, and I, I don't think actually your position is all that radical, Sue. And I think it's actually well-reasoned and well thought out based on what we're seeing. And I think many people will agree on both sides or on all sides if, if there's more than two. But we have one side is asking to defund the police. And when Mayor Frey in uh, Minnesota, or some Minneapolis, sorry, um, did not respond in the way that the crowd wanted when talking about dismantling or defunding and pushing funds away from the police department to other resources to help people, this is the reaction that he got. Go All right, so the change that they're talking about, I, I want to make sure I break it down, so I'm sorry if, I, if I'm looking down at my notes. It, it, it's twofold. In Minneapolis, uh, council members have said by a majority vote that they're going to defund the police, okay? In contrast, I think Governor Cuomo is actually speaking right now about a say-their-name reform. And he's kind of, and, and I'll start with Governor Cuomo because he's kind of outlining what that means. Uh, police disciplinary records will be transparent. Uh, if you are in New York, you might have heard about repealing 580, which keeps their records secret. He's also talking about banning chokeholds. He's also saying that race-based phone calls, things that we've seen with like Amy Cooper, who are calling the police on African-American men and saying that they're assaulting them when they are not. 
that those can be classified as hate crimes. He's also talking about appointing an attorney general to review all cases where police murders occur. Now, that's reform. That's not defunding. That's not really talking about the money that goes towards the police. Minneapolis is taking a different approach, much like Camden, New Jersey did in 2012, where they're saying police officers are given too much work to do. As Sue Ann said, they're they're first responders when someone is injured. They're supposed to be there when there are are, uh, emotionally distressed people, uh, like having mental health issues or uh, people who are going through drug withdrawal or drug issues or homelessness, substance abuse, children in school who who are being arrested by police officers. If you think that a situation does not require a gun to be there, the question you have to ask is, why are the police there? Do we not have more professionals who can address these issues where a gun is not necessary? And if your answer is yes to that, then you support defunding the police. It is not saying that police will not exist. There are situations where they are needed, just like the military. But we don't need the military in our homes when our children are are getting into arguments or fights in schools, when our emotionally distressed loved ones need help to go to the hospital. Or when someone's running down the street, they don't need to be gunned down. So when we're talking about defunding and these other reforms, Sue Ann, um, how do you kind of put the pieces all together as to where we should be moving in this reform or defunding step of police? I think I think defunding is the is the wrong word. I think it gets people kind of agitated, and a lot of times it has to do with the narrative of things. That idea. Uh, is really reallocating the resources that are is given to the police department to other areas, like you said. Secondly, it has to do with the police unions. The police unions are really who drives the whole political arm and political power, political clout of these police agencies that are able to stop reform and prevent progress and change within the police department, within their culture, because they give out endorsements. They um, donate to political campaigns. They have their own, for all essential purposes, lobby. And therefore, when their changes need to be implemented or progress needs to be made that um, the unions may not feel that they don't support, then they can easily kind of stamp that out because they have the money and the support um, to do so. So I think part of it has to do with people's discontent with police unions and their, um, you know, the power that they have. And so I think, again, it goes to culture of police unions. They don't have to see what the community wants or what the community is asking for as something against them. They should see it as what you're saying, Brian. Okay, let's bring in some other sort of resources, some other professionals. Um, There's cases where small kids in Florida, we have something called a Baker Act, where you can be Baker Acted if you're a threat to yourself or others. When a child is Baker acted from a school or from a public facility for some reason, for exhibiting some behavior where they think they might, they maybe they say they want to kill themselves or something like that, a police officer is called. A police officer has to then make an on-the-spot evaluation of a child, of a minor, sometimes as young as nine, eight, nine years old, and decide whether this child needs to be taken to a mental health facility. Why on earth would that be a a, a police officer's job? It absolutely shouldn't be. So I think the police unions need to sit down and stop looking at it as, hey, you guys are trying to take away from us, as opposed to the community is saying, we see that your system and how it is right now, you need help. You need help. And we're going to implement programs and put in other professionals to assist you so that you can do your job better. Yeah. And I, I think Sue Ann, I I give you a lot of credit. I mean, I give you a lot of credit for everything, but I I think specifically about the narrative. um, I hear a lot of people push back on, well, you're using the word defund. And when I hear defund, even though Sue Ann and Brian get on a show and explain it and it's detailed and it, and it hits the points and we bring up that it's successful in Camden, New Jersey, and it's a similar process that they're trying to do uh, in Minneapolis, because you use the word defund, uh, I I don't like it, so I don't want to do it. How do we reach those people? What, every one of our stances has to be properly articulated? Yes, yes, every single one has to be properly articulated because we live in a media-driven, image-driven culture. And so if it's not packaged properly, it's it's just not going to work. You cannot 
say, hey, you know, our job is to defund the police. People are immediately going to be like, well, hold on. If they don't have any money, how are they going to protect me if a robber shows up, if a rapist shows up? If you explain it, that it's a, it's reallocating resources or taking um, some of the authority away from uh, police unions, maybe that helps. But definitely, I think categorizing it as defunding the police, it's also misleading in what it says. Def it, because you're not essentially defunding the police. You're not, you know, collapsing that balloon and not having police anymore. So it makes it a problem. I see it all across the board, politically, different parties, you know, they just have better narratives. And so they're more successful. And I think that's why it's our job as communicators and, uh, you know, having a platform to make sure that we're giving proper information, we're explaining it properly, but even taking the time to you know, make sure the narrative is proper so when people are relaying it to others, it, it takes on the life and it's taken in the spirit that it's given, which is we want change. We want um, black and brown people to be able to be safe in their own communities, to be policed in a way that's healthy and not toxic, and, you know, for police to be held accountable when they do wrong things. That's what we want. So if you if you say our yeah. goal is to defund the police, it, it's, it's just not going to be successful. I, I, I could I could see that as a strong argument for sure. The only pushback I give on that is that there seems to be a higher standard for those that are protesting than those that are protesting against. Um, we'll we'll see how that works out. Of course, this is just the the first half of our segment. We also have keeping the peace, and I know that Vince Velasquez is there. Vince, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Great points, uh, by the way, Sue, and I can't I can't agree with you more on, on those points about the what defunding means and, and we're going to get into that in the next half hour yeah and and we hope vincent uh vincent that our articulation of it can help people uh but my little two cents about this is we always seem to want the protesters to package their message in the perfect way when it is a group of millions if not more people but then when it comes to the police and how they present information we say well we'll just take it from the brass of the head there seems to be this, this higher standard for protesters than for everyone else, and I'm not sure if it's going to be a perfect message all the time. I hope you guys hear um, these arguments and you kind of take them as a grain of salt. Uh, Vincent Velasquez next.